I purchased this lot of three pocket watches online, and of course, none of them work, since that's our MO, finding and restoring broken watches. I hope to feature them all at some point, but today we'll be looking at this one. So let's bring this to the bench and take a closer look, shall we? I'm really excited about this watch because it's probably one of the more sought after watches amongst collectors, a Hamilton 992. We'll take a methodical approach here and hopefully fix any issues that we discover along the way. The watch looks to be in good overall condition, but as we'll soon see, looks can be deceiving. This Hamilton comes in a salesman display case, which gives us a look at this gorgeous movement. So the watch winds, but the balance doesn't kickstart. Now, since this is a railroad grade watch, it's lever set, so I have to pull out the setting lever to set time, but I, mm, I can't get my fingertip to catch the little tab on the lever. Let's try with my tweezers here. Ah, there we go. And the time setting works nicely. Uh, my sense is that the Hamilton 992 ranks as one of the must-haves for any pocket watch collector. Many I've spoken with consider the 992 the railroad watch. Now this is the first model of 992s to be made with production beginning in 1903, which I suppose makes it the granddaddy of the 992s. The watch in our bench was manufactured in 1906. Oh, oh, okay, just noticed the funky jewel in this movement. We'll get to that later. Now the 992 was followed by the 992E in 1931, which incorporated Hamilton's Ellenvar hairspring. Balance isn't moving, so we'll let down the mainspring. Now the 992E was then replaced by the 992B around 1941, when Hamilton introduced its Ellenbar Extra. In totality, amongst all the variations, the 992 is the most popular railroad grade watch ever produced. Since this is a railroad grade watch, this meant that several specifications had to be met, which were designed to ensure accurate timekeeping in various situations. For example, the watch had to keep accurate time in five different positions, with the face up, the face down, the crown up, crown left, and crown right. Now, the watch also had to maintain accurate time in a range of temperatures and finally had to be adjusted for something called isochronism, which basically meant that the watch was accurate at various points of a wind, say at its full wind, near the end of its wind, and everything in between. Accurate timekeeping for railroads was brought to the fore uh, due to a train crash in 1891 in the town of Kipton, Ohio. Now what happened was, the watches of the engineers operating the two ill-fated trains were off by four minutes, resulting in the crash. And as a result, a commission was established which ushered in the railroad grade standards for pocket watches. Railroad grade watches also had to meet other requirements, such as being lever set. So when we were testing the time setting, we had to remove the bezel and then pull out the setting lever tab, right? Well, this design made it so that a user had to be really intentional about setting the time and couldn't, you know, accidentally set the time if say the winding crown was pulled up, such as in a traditional watch. Uh, the watch dial also had to have bold Arabic numerals, which improved a watch's readability and movement had to have a minimum of 19 joules. Okay, we removed most of the key this works. I'm just finishing up with the yoke now. Uh, 
As I remove the intermediate setting wheels, I want to highlight something under the microscope. Look at how the top surface of the wheels have a chamfered or a beveled edge. You'll want to make a note of this because when reinstalling these wheels, if the chamfered edge is facing wrong way up, then winding will be really difficult, almost like you can hear the gears grinding. And uh, <laughs> don't ask me how I know, okay? Now, I didn't like the way the balance moved earlier, so I'm mounting in isolation to get a better view of, ooh, yikes, better view of its action, yikes. I, I don't like the way it's reacting to the air. That's not the way it should be moving. A healthy balance should oscillate nice and freely, but this balance is snapping back, almost like it's under heavy tension. Okay, I just want to make sure the balance spins freely without the hairspring. That looks good. Now, taking a closer look at the hairspring, see how the stud is pressing down on the hairspring coils? This shouldn't happen. There should be adequate clearance between its bottom and the coils. And in our case, the stud is preventing the hairspring from breathing or, you know, opening and closing as the balance wheel turns. Now, here we see the problems caused by the hairspring being out of flat. The coils should spiral out from the center along the same horizontal plane. Can you see how the innermost coil is at an incline, putting it on a different plane than the others? We'll have to reshape the hairspring so that the coils are true in the flat. And this should fix our stud spacing. Now to do this involves twisting the inner coil, almost like you're wringing a wet towel. In principle, this sounds easy, but it took me more than an hour to get this right. And here is the end result. Now let's see if the balance rotates freely now. That looks much better, doesn't it? Great, that's just great. Now, it turns out there's still one more gremlin lurking in the balance, but we'll get to it later on. Let's move on for now. I always inspect the wheel pivots on antique pocket watches because there can be wear over time. And here we see some scoring on the pivots for the third wheel, escape wheel, and balance staff. And the scoring diminishes a watch's performance by increasing the friction. So we want to restore the pivots to a nice polished finish by burnishing with a Jaca tool. And a Jaca tool is basically a manual lathe and it comes with a few runners to accommodate varying pivot sizes. The numbering around the circumference of the runner is in hundredths of millimeters, so 22 means 0.22 millimeters. We secure the frame to a desk vise and I like to use a retractable ID card lanyard thing to pull or turn the lathe. To prep our jacket, we'll wrap the cord around the pulley. You see the little spindle at the head of the pulley? Well, one of the wheel's pivots will rest inside that while the other pivot will rest in the grooved bed of the runner. Now we'll use this burnisher to polish the pivots and it acts like a microfile and we slide it back and forth over the pivot as it's being turned. Now, one of the burnisher's edges is slightly rounded. The rounded edge is used for conical shaped pivots, like what you'd find on a balance staff. And the other edge is squared off, and that's used for all other pivots. Okay, I'm positioning the third wheel, and since the pivot's diameter is 0.23 millimeters, I'll rest it in the 0.22 millimeter groove so it can peak above the sides of the bed sliding the two little prongs forward until they straddle the wheel spoke. Now, since the prongs are attached to the pulley, as we turn the pulley, it'll rotate the wheel. I'm placing the squared edge of the burnisher against the pivot's shoulder, and we want to keep the burnisher as horizontal as possible. And when burnishing, my left hand pulls the pulley toward me, while my right hand pushes the burnisher away. Okay, done. And now we'll repeat the process for the other side. So we'll flip it 180 degrees. Oh, I forgot to mention that I added a little dab of oil on the burnisher prior to using it. 
This not only reduces friction, but also helps wick away the filed material from the pivot. You might notice how sometimes I only move one hand, either pulling on the pulley or just pushing the burnisher. And what I'm doing is I'm checking to feel whether the pivot is still catching against the surface of the burnisher. You should be able to feel the pivot rubbing against the burnisher. If not, it could mean that you've either removed too much material or that your burnisher isn't laying horizontal. Great, finish with the third wheel. Okay, let's burnish the escape wheel and balance staff now and the eagle-eyed will have noticed that I swapped tailstock runners to accommodate the smaller pivot sizes. And here I'm resting it into the groove marked 10, which again is 0 0.1 millimeters. Okay, I'm repositioning the prongs and I'm sliding it forward to straddle the spoke here. Okay, I'm going to pause here and see if I can feel the pivot rubbing against the burnisher. Good. Time to give the balance wheel some love here. <laughs> okay, let's see how the pivots look. First, the escape wheel. The balance wheel. the third wheel, okay with all that done let's get these parts cleaned up. I'm going to soak the dial in some denture cleaner for eight hours and then I'm going to put the case in an ultrasonic bath of ammonia. Now, since this is an old antique watch, I'm going to pamper them a little bit with a nice brush cleaning and alcohol. And that should break up and remove all the old grime. And once we're done pre-cleaning this, we can throw it into the cleaning machine. Okay, see you guys later. And the parts come out looking really nice. Okay, before we begin, there's another problem to address. The center wheel's lower jewel is shattered. Not a problem though, because we can replace it with one from a donor movement that I purchased. But to do this, we'll need to press the jewel out with the jewel press. The jeweling press consists of a base and a selection of reamers, stumps, and pushers to accommodate various jewel and hole sizes. Now I really like this tool, but its selection of stumps is somewhat limited, so I'm going to pair it with another jeweling press that I have. Now this is a Horia clone and it also comes with an assortment of stumps and pushers. What's really convenient is that they happen to be compatible with the base and spindle from my first set. And as you see, there are more stumps for me to choose from in this set. So let's get started. First, we'll select a stump with an opening wide enough to allow the jewel to be pushed through. Yes, and just matching it up, and I think this one will do. And now we select a pump pusher with a diameter that's slightly smaller than the jewels. And the pump pusher has a spring-loaded tip that helps with centering. 
and that tip will be placed in the jewel's hole. Just checking the fit here, that will work. Okay, seating the anvil in the base and sliding the pusher into the spindle. Now, before we press the jewel out, we'll apply some lubrication around its edges so that it can slide out smoothly. Positioning the plate between the pusher and the stump here. Now I'm going to slowly lower the pusher. And there, the jewel's pressed out. I was hoping it'd come out in one piece, but it was already cracked, so here's the replacement jewel, which I pressed out from the donor using the same process. Now, unfortunately, as I was trying to fit this new donor jewel in, I, I realized that it was just ever so slightly too tall to seat flushly in the hole. And because we're dealing with such small parts here, there's really very little tolerance for error. So having learned this lesson, I was a bit hesitant to buy another donor movement and just decided to pivot here. So we're going to install a modern jewel, but we'll first have to ream out the hole in this plate to accommodate the larger jewel size. Because the outside diameter of the new jewel is 2.3 millimeters, we'll select the reamer mark 23 which will create a hole that is 2.29 millimeters. Now the reamer has sharp edges along its length and by turning in the hole, we can remove some metal. All right, sliding the reamer into this collet and then the collet itself will slide into the spindle. Twisting the handle on the other end of the spindle draws the collet in, securing it in place. And now I'll swap the previous spindle with this reaming spindle. And we'll slide the reamer through the hole that we want to ream and begin turning it while at the same time applying downward pressure. And once the reamer slides through the hole, it'll be sized to our desired diameter of 2.29 millimeters. Because the outside diameter of the new jewel is 2.3 millimeters, and this slight one hundredth of a millimeter difference allows the new jewel to be held in place by friction. Let's get this new jewel pressed into the freshly reamed hole. I want the jewel to be flush with the plate, so I'll use a flat pusher with a diameter slightly wider than the jewels. Okay, I'm just going to center it here. It looks centered. And then we'll press the jewel in. With the jewel pressed in, we need to check the end shake of the center wheel now. Now here's a lateral view of the center wheel seated in its upper and lower jewels. End shake is the amount of up, down, or vertical play in the center wheel. Too little end shake binds the wheel and prevents it from rotating too much, and the wheel won't mesh neatly with adjacent wheels. End shake can be adjusted by altering the depth of the lower jewel, which we just fitted. If a wheel needs more vertical play, we can press the jewel deeper to provide more vertical spacing and vice versa. Okay, installing the center wheel and the bridge. I'm going to gently pull on the wheel to test end shake. And it feels really tight. And yeah, it's not spinning with air, so we will have to increase the end shake. And as you can imagine, it's an iterative process to achieve the right amount of end shake, but this micrometer dial on the jeweling tool assists with this. It limits how far the spindle can be plunged. By turning the style, you can precisely control the depthing of the jewel. When we rotate it clockwise, 
it allows the jewel to be pushed in deeper and vice versa. This time we're going to use a pusher with a diameter slightly smaller than the jewels. Centering the jewel and press it down. I adjusted the jewel's depthing about five times before the end shake was acceptable. And here it is. Just the right amount of end shake. And more importantly, look how nicely it spins with air. Perfect. Okay, with that out of the way, let's begin our assembly with the mainspring. Hooking the arbor to the inner coil. Okay, and I'm going to lubricate the mainspring. and the arbor shoulder before we close the lid. I'm going to line up the little tab in the hairspring with the little notch in the lid. And then I can press it down. Okay, after cleaning the balance jewels, I'm reinstalling the upper hole jewel. And I'm going to press the jewel in with the staking set. Now the lower jewel is cracked, so I bought a replacement. And we'll get this one pressed in now. And let's oil the upper and lower cap jewels with this automatic oiler. Okay, kudos to you if you noticed the funky center jewel during our disassembly. It looks like someone replaced it with a brass bushing and honestly, I'm pretty impressed. I mean, I wouldn't be able to fabricate this, that's for sure, which is why I just borrowed a new jewel from the donor movement. Let's set the train of wheels, beginning with the escape wheel. Okay, and this is the fourth wheel. And of course the pivot of the fourth wheel holds the seconds hand from the other side. Now we'll get this train wheel bridge screwed down. Okay, great. The wheels spin freely as they should. I'm going to slide the third wheel into place. After oiling the barrel's lower bushing, I can install the mainspring barrel. And here comes the center wheel. Applying some DX grease. I'll apply some DX grease to the winding arbor where the sliding clutch slides down. And I'll do the same for where the winding pinion slides onto the arbor.
and we can get this set into the main plate now. So this is what makes these antique pocket watches such a joy to work on. First of all, they really provide a bridge to a bygone time and they're just visually stunning. I can't help but admire this movement. Now, some things I didn't mention about this amazing watch, the jewel settings are all gold and the center wheel is also made of gold and the movement boasts rubies and sapphires for jewels. So you really get the sense that these were designed to the highest standard, something you could really be proud about carrying around. Dare I say, much like a modern day Rolex. Look at that beautiful damascening on the plates. Okay, checking the motion of the wheels, nice. And we'll get the ratchet wheel down. Oh, now Hamilton, of course, started out as an American watch manufacturer in the 1890s, but eventually was acquired by the Swiss in, I think, the 1970s and is now part of the Swatch Company. Let's apply some D5 oil here before setting the crown wheel. Some crown wheels are secured by a reverse thread screw, but in our case, there are two little screws that do the job. Now, as I was preparing to install the click, I realized that I had made a mistake. I shouldn't have installed the uh, ratchet wheel first because that blocks the click from engaging from the, with the, with the uh, click spring. And so I remove the ratchet wheel and I'm installing the click first. And now we can reinstall the ratchet wheel. Just look at that movement, my goodness. Now we'll flip this watch over and work on the dial side getting the intermediate setting wheels in place. And these little wheels engage with the sliding clutch and they actuate the minute wheel when the watch is in uh, time setting mode. Applying some DX grease where the yoke comes into contact with the sliding clutch. Setting the yoke spring in place. Great, and pulling the arm into the groove in the clutch. Now here's the yoke. Okay, remember how we weren't able to pull out the setting lever when we were testing the time setting? So I sourced the replacement setting lever from our donor movement. And you can see how the tab in the donor lever has a higher profile. Now I thought I was all good to go, but when I tried to install it, it wouldn't fit and here's why. So you see how tall this part of the lever is? It prevents the lever from sitting flush on the plate. And you can see the difference with the original lever. It's not as tall here, you see that? So hmm, I'll have to find a way to uh, repurpose the original lever. Here's the lever sitting in the plate. I'm going to try to bend the tab so that it's more upright and that way it's easier to catch with your finger. 
See how the bend in the lever causes the end with the tab to lean back? If we can take out that bend, this will pull the tab forward, creating the profile we need. Prior to shaping steel, I know it's important to preheat it to prevent it from snapping. Now once heated, I'm going to do my best Lord of the Rings Dorvin blacksmith impression and flatten the lever in the staking set. And here's the end result on the left compared to the untreated lever on the right. Since this is a high friction area, applying DX grease to the yoke where it makes contact with the setting lever. And we'll get the reshaped setting lever in place. I reheated the setting lever and quenched it in water to reharden it. Screw it down here before we test it out. Ah, and there we go. I can easily grab the tab with my thumbnail now. Now we can apply a tiny droplet of oil to each pallet stone. Seating the pallet fork into its lower jewel here. And now we can get the pallet fork bridge down. Just positioning it. Just want to make sure that the upper pivot of the pallet fork seats neatly in the jewel. Okay, we'll get the screw down. Mm -hmm. Moves nicely and tugging on it a little bit just to see if it's seated. Great. Okay, let's get some wind in this thing. And I'm going to lower the balance in. And hopefully this watch will want to start. There have been a lot of issues here, so fingers crossed. Hey, look at that. Great. That's awesome. That's really awesome to see. Okay, let's get the balance cock screwed down now. And let's lubricate the pivots. I'm using the lowest viscosity oil, Mobius 9010, on all the pivots. Before putting this on the time grapher, let's come back to the balance. Now the regulating arm was originally positioned here. Now this arm is used to make fine adjustments to the rate at which the watch runs. In other words, either speeding up or slowing down a watch. So when it's swung to one extreme like this, it usually means there's an underlying issue. Initial time grapher readings looked okay, but when you look closer, you'll see I had to move the regulating arm to one extreme because it was running too slowly. And the problem is that there were too many timing washers on the meantime screws. And these washers add weight to the balance wheel, thus slowing the wheel down. When I removed them all, the watch ran too fast, gaining about 120 seconds a day. We can correct this by using properly calibrated timing washers and this funky screwdriver that looks like something out of a nightmare or the uh, alien movie. Ah! Timing washers are small brass donuts that are used to add weight to the balance, either to poise it or in our case to slow down a watch. Now, since our watch is gaining about two minutes a day, we need to use two washers from the second vial 
one each on opposing mean time screws. Let's remove one mean time screw with this balance screw remover. And once the blade is in the timing screw slot, we'll release the prongs so that they grip the screw head. You'll notice the prior washer that was installed. The other mean time screw had three washers attached. And now we can slide the properly weighted timing washer down the screw's shaft. Oh, okay, now we can exhale and screw the mean time screw back into the balance rim. I did this for the opposite side as well. And here are the new readings. You'll notice the regulating arm is now positioned in the middle. Okay, let's get the cannon pinion down here. So with my watch restorations, I, I usually do one of two things. Either I keep them for my own personal collection, or I sell them on eBay or online somewhere. And that's just to fund our next project. Um, but for this one, I think I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I recently got in touch with an old friend who stumbled across this channel. And while we were talking, Solomon expressed some interest in picking up a pocket watch and asked if I could keep an eye out for something nice. So I thought, why not just give this one to him? Solomon sports the occasional three-piece suit, so I think this watch would pair really nicely with it. Anyway, I really hope you'll enjoy this watch. Casing the movement here. And we'll get the case screws secured. With the salesman display back flaunting such an iconic movement, I decided to replace the display crystal. I think you'll agree that it really does accentuate the movement. Let's set the hands now, beginning with the hour hand. Nice, the setting lever works really nicely. So I'd like to encourage you, if maybe you've thought about getting into this hobby but were afraid to, you know, give it a shot. Search on eBay, there are tons of pocket watch movements. I'd start with probably a 16 size or 18 size one, preferably one that's running so that when you put it back together, you'll know if you've done something wrong or not because it should, it should be running still. Okay, great. The hands don't cross over each other. And if you haven't noticed, um, watchmakers and hobbyists like myself like to set the time to either 150 or 1010. And that's because supposedly that makes a smiley face on the face of the watch. I can kind of see it, but I don't know. Anyway, here's a final peek at this amazingly gorgeous movement. And it was such a joy and pleasure to work on this, it really was. I hope Solomon will really enjoy this watch when he looks at the movement through the gorgeous display case. So once again, thank you so much for joining me along this journey. I really do appreciate your support and, and hope you learned something along the way. 
Until our next restoration, be well. <laughs>